Okay, well, all the flowers have been given out and everything's been done. There's only one other person we really need to hear from today, and that's Robin Pork. It is such a privilege to have you here, Robin. Um, please give a big PTUK welcome for our keynote speaker, Robin Pork. Right, hopefully I'm live, because I'm not going up there, I'm staying down here. So hopefully the cameras can follow me, and what I'm going to do is find some people I can pick on, and then I'll be happy. Okay, so first of all, thank you, PTUK, for inviting me. Um, Emma Wood, wherever she is, if she's here, thank you for getting me here after the flight was cancelled. And when I got here, no hotel room. So I felt very loved. <laughs> but she sorted it all out. And obviously, thank you, because without you, me walking up and down here talking would look a bit silly. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today, if this works, is talk about the growth and development and glitches in the human brain. So I want to give you an idea of how the human brain really works. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for probably 20 years, I have been trying to develop a model of how this thing really works. And about four years ago, various other bits and bobs of research came along and my model was actually proved to be right. So when you think about it, I started when I was 15. I'm now nearly 35. <laughs> and it's very rewarding when ideas you've held for a long time actually prove to be right. So what I'm going to try and do today, now that Monica's stolen nearly all of my time. I've got <laughs> 10 minutes left. Um, what I'm going to try and do is show you how I think this brain of ours works. So we need a simple model, and that's what I'm going to provide, because we need to know how the brain works, how it functions, because then if we know how it functions when it's working normally, we'll have a better idea of what's happening when it goes wrong. And that's what we're all dealing with, aren't we, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want to dispel a few myths. So, for example, the left side of the brain controls the right arm. Wrong. The left side of the brain controls the right arm. The right side of the brain controls your hand. And it's not the brain that decides which hand you're going to use. It's your spinal cord. So little bits of research along the line. A German researcher was looking at uh, x-rays, scans, not x-ray scans, of babies sucking their thumbs. And he thought, that's weird, because at the time these babies are sucking their thumbs, their brain isn't connected to their thumbs, but their spinal cord is. So there's lots and lots of mistakes. Dyslexia is a brain processing issue. No, in the vast majority of cases, it's not a processing issue. It's an eye control issue. So if we can dispel these myths, these mistakes, then we can have a much better understanding of what really happens. Pigeonholing. Everybody knows what the DSM-5 is, yeah? yeah? Yeah. So I want to rubbish the current way we diagnose, label, and pigeonhole children with learning and behavioral disorders. I mean, the DSM-4, and then the DSM-5 following on, I mean, absolute nonsense, because if I can't get you to fit in a particular pigeonhole, I make another one that's bigger, wider, deeper, and it's just stupid. So we need to get rid of that. So what we need to do is get children diagnosed by pediatric or functional neurologists 
to understand what's the underlying cause of the problem, not which box can I get you to fit into best. So I want to look at that. By doing this, we'll hopefully have a much better way of thinking about the issues of childhood and the best way to help children. Now, words. Words can be really tricky because words can prevent you from even attempting to learn something. So if you go to a classroom of children and say, we're going to talk about poetry, they go, oh, I hate poetry. Or we're going to do philosophy. Oh, no. Right? But if you said, we're going to talk about the lyrics of pop songs, yeah. Or, which do you prefer, Emmerdale, Corrie, or Enders? Right? Then you've got the children's attention. So there are barriers. So I'm going to use a lot of big words, but I'll try and break them down and explain them as we go along. And there will be pictures. And this incredible thing here means I can laser the screen or anyone who boos. <laughs> OK, so myths and mistakes in neurology. There are 100 billion neurons in the human brain. Now, this idea has been around for donkey's years. 100 billion brain cells, neurons. Wrong. It is the encephalization of the cerebral cortex that gives us intelligence. Wrong. I was thinking when I was reviewing this, I used that word encephalization. Who was at the conference in Bristol? This is going back a while. Yeah? Do you remember me? Do you still love me? <laughs> I, um, I used the word, and there were two ladies to the side of me doing sign language. Right? And as I used the word encephalization, I shouldn't have done it, but I did. It was a, a really grave mistake. I turned to one of them and said, I bet that's got you. <laughs> then... They were behind me because I was standing at the front. All the way through the lecture, the rest of the morning, they were signing things about me. <laughs> so if there's anybody here signing, I promise I'll be nice. <laughs> OK, so encephalization, it big word for meaning brain get bigger. So the reason I want to talk about this is... It's a theory that's been around for donkey's years, this encephalization thing. And it goes, it's, a, it's an example of how things can go wrong, how you can be misled. So the encephalization theory, basically what it says is that creatures on the planet have a body and they have a brain. And so the, what they tried to do was say that if your brain is a bigger than would be expected, then you should be intelligent, right? So it's fairly straightforward. So if we look at the, some of the creatures on here, we've got, um, this is a bit, bit sad, but down the bottom, right down the bottom here, we've got the goldfish. And I always feel sad. You see these little bowls and the goldfish going around. It. And you think, poor little thing. But it's got a tiny, tiny little brain. So at the bottom here, we've got the weight in kilograms. And then we've got, the, that's the body. And then over here, we've got, uh, we've got the, the weight of the brain. So goldfish down the bottom. And up here at the top, we've got the blue whale. Now, if you look down over to the side, oh, I keep pressing the wrong button, I'm so sorry. This one here, Australopithecus, that just means southern ape. Um, this is one of our ancestors, and he had a bigger brain than we do now. So we're um, on the other side. But I just wanted to look at him first of all, Gorilla, 
modern man, chimpanzee. So the, the modern chimpanzee had a smaller brain than our ancestor. And we're up here, and then the porpoise has got a bigger brain, his elephant's got a bigger brain, blue whale's got a bigger brain. Now, for donkey's years, people thought that it was this relationship was important. So we're going to look at the fate of Neanderthal man. Now, Neanderthal man has significantly... <laughs> what? <laughs> Neanderthal man had a significantly bigger brain, so modern man, and man in particular as opposed to woman, has a brain of 1,400 cubic centimetres. Neanderthal man... 1,600, which is significant, right? So Neanderthal man disappeared. He's now extinct. Well, he's not. His DNA is still around, and you can find it in certain people. <laughs> um, but Homo sapiens survived, and the, th the interesting thing is that we humans have a very much bigger cerebellum. Now, through the course of the talk, I will be talking I brought this whoever's brain this is, I'll give it back later. <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about is right brain, left brain, cerebellum. So this thing here, this is significantly bigger than you would expect. And as we find out later, it's bigger in boys than it is in girls. So significantly bigger. So Neanderthal man had a bigger brain than us by 200 cubic centimetres, but we had a significantly bigger cerebellum. And that's a clue, perhaps, to where I'll be heading. Now, I obviously put that flickery thing down somewhere. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. OK. So basically, we tend to think that all this lot here is really, really important. And obviously, it is. Um, and one of the things to realize about it is it's a bit like a souffle. So when it's growing, it folds. You hope when you're cooking a souffle, it folds over, it expands. So. For donkey's years, we thought that this is really, really important. And the little fella down the bottom here, the cerebellum, we've tended to ignore to our cost. Now, when we talk about the brain, we talk about the cortex. And the cortex is just this stuff on the outside here. All the stuff underneath we call white matter. And this is the axons of neurons, the wires coming out, which are covered in fat. That's why they look white. So we call the stuff on the outside gray matter. We call the stuff on the inside white matter. So if you could get rid of all that white matter and have it like your smartphone, we could have a much, much smaller brain. right? But we can't. We have to have all this wiring. So look how much white matter there is here, all this white stuff. And then look here, this is a slice through the cerebellum, that little brain at the back. And you can see how little white stuff there is compared to the grey stuff. And this view is described as the arbor vitae, which means the tree of life. Has anybody got a clue as to where I'm heading? Now, what is really, really important is not the size of the brain, because I could have a brain you know, the size of a, a whale. It's neuron density. It's how many brain cells you can pack in. And what I want to look at is, as an example is what is called von Echinomo neurons. Now, you may think that a neuron is a neuron is a neuron, but they're not. They're all different. They're still called neurons, but
but you've got granular neurons, you've got gigantopyramidal neurons, you've got Purkinje cells, you've got all sorts. So we're just going to look at von Ecke nomo neurons. And the reason, I hope, will become clear as we progress through the talk. So if we look at the brain of an orangutan, they have a few isolated von Ecke nomo cells. If we look at the brain of a gorilla, they've got a few more. If we look at the chimp and the bonobo, they have three or four grouped together. Does everybody know what a bonobo is? No? You will do. We humans have groups of six von Echinomos working together, so a functional unit, and we have got thousands and thousands of them, more in the right side of the brain than in the left. Now, I don't know if you know this, but historically people said that our left brain is the intelligent brain. It's where most of us do speech and language, science, mathematics, all the clever stuff, left brain. So von Ecke nomo cells, as you'll find later, are the latest type of cell to have evolved. And they're associated with rapid processing. So why would you put more in the right side of the brain than in the left? Yeah. Right, I put this picture of a lady up to make sure you didn't think I was a male chauvinist pig. I said earlier that I have this idea, a model of the brain, of how, the brain, how we should think about the brain and how it works. And Susanna, uh, back in 2014, came out with some research which was staggering absolutely amazing. So she is one of my female heroes. There are a few in the room here as well, but she's one of my female heroes. So Susanna challenged this 100 billion neuron number. So what she did was she got on the internet and went around saying, this 100 million brain cell business, where did that come from? And I asked this person, and this, she asked people all the way around the world, and every single one of them said, I don't know, it's always been there. There's always been 100 billion. So what do you do when someone says that to you? Having asked around, she headed off to the kitchen and made some soup. That's what ladies do, isn't it? <laughs> okay. She actually didn't head off to the kitchen. She headed off to the laboratory, and there she made brain soup. So what she did was she dissolved brain in a really special detergent, so it became a liquid, added a dye that only links on to neurons, and then got a microscope and did some counting. Okay? So in fact, we haven't got 100 billion. We've got, and the numbers vary, 86 to 87 billion neurons in the human brain. And guess what? Of those 87 billion neurons, 68 billion, roughly 80%, are not here, they're in the cerebellum, that little brain at the back. Sorry, thank you. My personal assistant. So imagine 80% of your brain cells in here, leaving only about 20% for your brain. And this is the thing that we've been worshipping and going on about for donkey's years, while we ignore this little fella at the back. Okay. The other thing is there's probably more brain cells in the right brain than there is in the left. And I talk about the right brain, left brain cerebellum because I want to introduce something a little bit later on. So I want to get you familiar with the concept. Okay, so a second female idol. This is, well, I discovered her a while back. 
So back in 1995, Esther Dimchinsky published a paper, very boring title, Spindle Neurons of the Human Anterior Cingulate Area. Okay. So brain, split it open, and the little bit I'm touching here on the inside wall of the brain is your anterior cingulate, and there will be pictures coming up later. So she discovered that there were spindle cells in that little bit of the brain. In 1999, she published a second paper, a neuronal morphologic type unique to humans and the great apes. And two things happened. Obviously, I fell in love, and the floodgates of research opened. So von Echinomo neurons, very, very, very important to how our brain functions. So after Esther published her two papers, John Allman at Caltech, Patrick Hoff, Bud Craig, Fahajo, they published papers. And in 19, sorry, in 2005, spindle cells became known as von Echinomo neurons. Two reasons. One, spindle cells was a term already used in the field of oncology. So if you were looking up spindle cells, because like me, you were very excited about it, you'd end up looking at a lot of stuff about cancer. And so what they decided to do, it was John Allman, he decided in honor of von Echinomo, they would name spindle cells in humans and the great apes, von Echinomo cells. So in our brain, they're called von Echinomo cells. In the whale, in the, whale the dolphin, um, various other creatures you'll see shortly, they changed. So elephants, Indian and, uh, and uh, African, certain dolphins, whales, and manatees, they have spindle cells. So it's, it's rather like saying motor car. We've got a Lamborghini, the whale's got golf polo. So... It's a similar type of cell, but it's not exactly the same as in the human and in the great ape. I know. <laughs> Aren't they lovely? I mean, they're huge, great sort of... But they're gorgeous, aren't they? I was on a boat um, off the coast of Florida um, trying to be a captain of a boat driving it along, and just down there was a manatee made by day. Gorgeous things. Okay, so the postnatal development of the human brain mimics evolution. So the postnatal human brain goes through a hunter-gatherer paleolith paleolithic stage, followed sometime later by a farmer neolithic stage, and now, of course, it has to go through an age of technology stage. So whereas all the von Echinomo neurons uh, in the chimpanzee's brain are present on day 230 of gestation, and their pregnancy, I think, off the top of my head, is 250 to 260 days. So the chimpanzee has the, all their von Echinomo cells but by day 230, we only have 15% of our stock of brains of von Echinomo neurons at birth. The remaining 85% develops in a window four months to four years after birth. And back in 2005, I coined the term bipoptosis. I don't know if you know there's an apoptosis. Have you heard of apoptosis? You will have, because we're going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, it's programmed cell death. So we've got apoptosis, and then I came up with bipoptosis, and a lot of academics said, pork, you don't know what you're talking about. It's stupid. It doesn't mean anything. I said, well, you've got A, and then you've got B. It's logical. So, and it's kind of sort of, isn't it? It's there. Bipoptosis. You can imagine dancing to it. 
Okay, so why am I going on about this? What is the point? Well, von Echinomo neurons, these brain cells last to have evolved super fast, super efficient. They're only found in three locations of the human brain. And again, you're sitting there thinking, but so, this is boring. Why are you going on about it? Well, those three locations are all in the prefrontal cortex. So these super-duper, latest we've evolved, fastest, you know, the Porsche of the neuron world, why would they all be in the prefrontal cortex? So here you can see the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is the dark blue, the light blue, not the pale blue at the top. So dark blue. So this is the outside wall, the lateral wall of the brain. And then all this blue stuff here, the dark blue, not the light blue, this is prefrontal cortex. So it's a huge area of brain. OK, so the evolution of the prefrontal cortex during our evolution, evolution, the prefrontal cortex, that very front bit of the brain, this bit here, has increased in size by around 33%. Well, that is massive, isn't it? How many people like cats? Anybody got a pussy cat at home? I'm a dog person myself, but, you know, <laughs> I understand why some of you would like cats. The domestic cat, their prefrontal cortex has only grown by 5%. That's why they just lie there and purr. So this is significant in terms of regional encephalization, that word again. Very important. Our prefrontal cortex, and if we have enough time, because I programmed this lecture to run for at least three hours, so we might run out of time. Um, as we find out later, the parietal cortex, the bit at the back that processes all the sensory information, that has expanded similarly. So the front of our brain, to make us human, has expanded, and as a consequence, the parietal cortex has, has, to, has, had, has had to explain. I'm going to go and get some water. Now, one of these jugs, I think, is vodka. Let's see. Yeah, that's the vodka. <laughs> oh. I know, but you've drunk most of it. <laughs> I know you, Monica. This is just a little reminder. When you look at illustrations in books, online, whatever, take whatever you see with a huge pinch of salt. I don't know why it happens, but obviously, in the you know, majority of cases, it's artists that do the illustrations. But you'd think somebody would check and say, no, that's not there, it's there. But they don't. And I'm constantly looking at illustrations and thinking, why would you put that there? Mm -hmm. So you could look at three illustrations and find something like Wernicke's errors in three different places. OK, the other thing to remember is that our brain has gyri, bumps, and sulci, depressions. But they're not fixed. They're like a fingerprint. So your brain, your gyri and sulci, will be as individual as you are. Because I don't know how many there are in the room here, but every single one of you looks different. So our brains are the same. And how many people said they like cats? Yeah, did you know your cat hasn't got sulci and gyri? My dog has, but your cat has <laughs> They're what's called lysencephalic. They've got smooth brains. So we don't all have, all the creatures on the planet have the same brains. Dogs are best. Dogs are best. <laughs> okay. 
So let's talk about the frontal hub, because that's where these von Ackermann neurons live. And we're going to talk about three areas of the brain that make the hub. So first of all, I'm going to tell you what those areas are. Then I'm going to tell you what a hub is. And then I'm going to say why they're so important. So first of all, the insular cortex, then the dorsal lateral convexity, then the anterior singlet. Now, I'll explain as we go along. One of the problems we have is that people, when they were describing animals, talk about quadrupeds, because most planets, creatures on the planet are on all fours. We are bipeds. We walk around on our hind legs. So it gets a bit confusing, because this should be the top of me here, but it's not, it's the back of me. This should be my belly facing the ground, but it's facing forwards. So it all gets very confusing. So what you'll find is words like dorso, lateral, anterior, can mean sort of something, and you think, well, that's wrong, because it's at the front, and it should... But I'll explain as we go through. Right. So this shows you, this is one of the best illustrations I have ever come across, and it shows you the insular cortex. So this green bit here, you have to lift up this bit of the brain here, and you have to pull down this bit of the brain here, and then you discover this. Most people have no idea it is there. So you're amongst a tiny, tiny percentage of people on the planet that know about it. So you could wander up to people and say, I know about the insulin. <laughs> and they go, ah. right. So you could go into a dissection suite and look at a brain and never know that's there until someone tells you. So the insular cortex, as I just said, very few people on the planet are aware of its existence. And yet, and yet, it is this hidden region of the brain that provides your umwelt, your very own, totally unique perception of reality. Have you come across the word umwelt before? Yeah. All the clever people on this side are going, yes, <laughs> yes. I'll pick on them in a minute. Yeah, basically, none of us see the world in exactly the same way. Whatever we see is unique, and most of it is virtual reality. Okay? How long have I been walking up and down here? A while. Ask me to describe the people sat here behind me. I wouldn't have a clue. Right? And yet, I've been walking up and down here. So... We only see what we want to see, need to see. So bear that in mind, virtual reality. So you hearing me, seeing me, feeling peckish, needing the loo, is all happening in your anterior insular cortex. So what creates this umwelt? So sensory information from your body, we call this interoceptive. So that's, oh, I need the loo, or oh, I wish I'd had breakfast this morning, I'm really feeling peckish. All those feelings, your big toes hurting because you stubbed it getting out of bed this morning in a hurry because you overslept, whatever, all that internal information we call interoceptive, and all the stuff that's coming into our body, we call extraceptive. <laughs> so that's what you're hearing, seeing, feeling on your skin, tasting in your mouth, whatever. Right? So we've got all that sensory information. And if we take, say, vision, vision takes place in your occipital cortex, at the back of your brain, the parietal cortex at the side of your brain, and the temporal cortex lowering your brain. But not all vision is seeing. Not all incoming data is processed. 
and a great deal of your vision is primitive and will be prioritized if needs be. So if we had to process everything, so imagine I'm going to look all the way around at every single one of you, and I've got to memorize all of it. I've got to see all of it. My brain would explode. There'd be a mess everywhere. Right? So what it does is it selects. So when I first look down the aisle here, I have a rough idea of what's here. And that's all I need. I don't need to know every single detail about this lady's hair, the whatever it's called, lanyard she's wearing, the white, blue, red top. I don't need that information. I just need to know that somebody sat there. And so we don't take in all the information. It's limited. So primitive vision. So our Paleolithic visual centers, so we're going back a long, long way in time, So the magnocellular area, so I'm going to put my brain back together again. There will be a picture in a minute, but this is quicker. This bit here, where you can see my finger, that is where, on each side, your magnocellular visual center lives. So the magnocellular area of the parietal cortex detects movement in your peripheral visual fields. So if something's moving out here, we need to detect it, and we need to look at it. And looking at it is reflexogenic. You don't have to think, oh, I think there's something over there scary. I better look. Just You do it. OK, so it's a reflex. Further down, the parvocellular area of the temporal lobe attempts to identify potential dangers. Who's walked down a dark country lane and frightened yourself to death? <laughs> I was going to say wet yourself, but this is being filmed, and I thought I'd better not say that. But we've all done it. I haven't, obviously, because I'm incredibly macho. But everybody's done it. And that is this parvocellular area trying to identify from limited information, is that a wolf, a bear, partially obscured by a bush? No, it's a bin bag blowing in the wind, right? It's defensive. You have to look at it, OK? What do you see? Yeah, that same area of the brain gives us this thing, pareidolia which is where we see things like dolphins in the clouds or a face in a stone. Yeah? Good word to know, isn't it? Just imagine how you can impress your friends, saying, oh, look at that, a fabulous example of pareidolia. <laughs> so this gives us an idea about history. So we've got the Paleolithic area, which is this one down the bottom here. Sorry, <laughs> the blue one, not the one up there here, the blue one. And you can see that way back in time, Homo habilis was around, what they call the habiline um, group. And then we get to Homo erectus, um, which was, we became upright, we came out of the trees and stayed on the ground. And round about a million years ago, Heidelberg Genesis came across, along, and that was the origins of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. So we had a long period through the Paleolithic times, and then going into the Neolithic period. Uh, so basically, if you go back to our real origins, we're talking five million years ago, but recently, just a few thousand years. OK, the nucleus basalis of Maynard. I pop this in. It's located... You can't see it very well. So this is the bottom of the brain, and where I'm pointing in there, there's a picture coming up in a minute. So the nucleus basalis of Maynard... 
Um, it lives in the base of the brain, and what it does is it controls the amount of reality to virtual reality in your vision. Now, I'm trying to hammer this home because you're sitting there thinking, I don't do that, I see properly, but you don't. You don't see properly, and you are not actually living at this time, as I'll show in a moment. Okay, so what happens is this bit of the brain will cut into reality if you're in a dangerous situation or a real babe magnet moves up beside you. <laughs> so it receives information directly from the retina and what it does, if it thinks there's a real danger, all of a sudden... Um, what can we have? Which county are we in, Cheshire? Yeah. Okay, so it's a leopard. So a leopard comes in here, you are really going to look at that. But if somebody, a member of the team, a member of the staff of the hotel just walked around, you wouldn't even right, give it a second glance because you don't need to, it's not a danger. And this is where the nucleus of... In this area here, this is called the anterior perforated substance. You see it's got little holes in it like a sieve, and it's where blood vessels come through, and that's where your nucleus basalis of Maynard lives. I need to mention something. Last evening, we had a wonderful meal together with Monica, and I was talking to a lady called Jess, who can't be here today, but she's going to watch the film of this, so I need to say this just for Jess. Jess, these are the brain's boobies. <laughs> they are, look, mammillary bodies. It says so there. She didn't believe me. So she's going to watch this. Jessica, the brain's boobies. So your brain, in order to save energy, operates rather like a mobile phone in predictive text mode and it guesses what comes next based on our experience and the use of limited data to create your virtual reality. So if you had to process everything, I promise you, you would go balmy. You couldn't do it. So the brain has to limit the information rather than use everything that's out there. Similarly, um, a lot of young children struggle with new clothes because the labels bother them. Things are too tight. I've got this growth here at the moment. Um, when you got dressed this morning, I'll pick on you, yeah, because you're foreign. Um, when you got dressed this morning, you probably felt your socks when you put them on, but the time you were pulling your jeans up, you didn't feel your socks. So we filter out huge amounts of information because I don't want to be walking up and down here feeling my socks, my shoes, my trousers. I nearly said my knickers then. My shorts. Um, so anything that we don't need, we filter out. And it's the same with vision and hearing. We only see, we only hear what we need to see, we, not, we need to hear. In an emergency, fight or flight, we expend more energy and really look at a person or situation and process vast amounts of visual data for just a few seconds. The advantage of, advantage of drinking vodka is that gin has a blue haze. So you'd know. Vodka doesn't. Okay. So what would happen? So the magnocellular area of the right parietal cortex must become the executive. So we've got one on each side, but it must become the executive and decide whether or not you need to look at every trivial movement in your peripheral visual fields. Okay, does that make sense? 
So what would happen if a six-year-old boy did not have a fully functioning right magnocellular area? Rochelle, give me the answer. I've been waiting to pick on you. <laughs> okay, so if you've got a little boy who can't decide whether I need to look at that or look at that or look at that or look at that, you put them into a classroom, a busy classroom, and they're going to be diagnosed as having ADD. Yeah? When in fact, it's just the magnocellular area on the right is under-functioning. So this is why we need to look at what causes the issues we see rather than saying, well, we put her in the ADHD box. I haven't decided about you yet. <laughs> Dyspraxic box, I think. <laughs> so the whole question of inattention. If you're a hunter-gatherer, and remember our brain has to go through a hunter-gatherer, a paleolithic stage, you react to movement in your peripheral visual fields, and we call it vigilance, which you have to be. If you're a hunter trying to catch food, you've got to make sure that something isn't catching you. You've got to be vigilant. If you're a six-year-old boy in a busy classroom and you react to movements in your peripheral visual field, we call it inattention, uh, sorry, <coughs> attention deficit disorder, and usually these kids are misdiagnosed with ADD, ADHD. So this is just to make sure you know where this magnocellular area is. It's here. So the back part of the parietal cortex blends with the occipital cortex, and the temporal lobe down here also blends with the occipital cortex. And there are separate pathways from your eyes to your occipital cortex. Uh, cortex right at the very back, back here. There's separate pathways that branch off and go up here and go around here and back there. It's a thing called Mayer's Loop. Okay? So how does your insular cortex function? Do you remember we talked about that green area? If you pull the top bit up and pull the bottom bit down and you're in the minority of people on the... Well, you're the, you're the majority of the people on the planet that know about it. Okay, so firstly, because of the varying processing speeds of the sensory modalities, once processed, the information from your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your skin, all that information is passed to the clostrum to await the arrival of other pertinent data. So... Hearing, seeing, taste, touch, all processed at different speeds. So if it's all happening at different speeds, how do you blend it all together? So what you do is you put it in the clostrum, and there's a picture coming up in a minute of it, and you leave it there. So you can think of the clostrum as being like a car park, where you say, oh, I've finished. I say, right, wait over there. This lady said, I've finished. I say, okay, wait over there. And then when we've got all the stuff, visual, auditory, light touch, pain, when it's all processed in the clostrum, we can then move it forward to the insular cortex. So because of this, what you thought was now actually happened a few milliseconds ago. So we are all living in the past. So when the information arrives in the posterior insular cortex, the interoreceptive information from inside us and the exteroreceptive data from outside us is blended and then it gets passed forward to the middle insular cortex. And this is the close room. So this is a slice through the brain. So if you imagine, you know when you've got a, um, a boiled egg for breakfast and you slice the top off, well, that's what we've done to the brain. And this is the right side of the brain. And the red bit is your clostrum. It's in what's called the extreme capsule. And the cortex here, right slap bang next to it, is your insular cortex. So we park the information there, ready to pass it across to the insular cortex. So 
And it's interesting because, I don't know how this is possible if I'm 35, but about 55 years ago, <laughs> nobody knew what the Clostrum did. And it annoyed me because it's in prime real estate. It's in one of the most important places in the brain and nobody knows what it does. And then just a few years ago, um, I've, I always say two years ago, and then I think, oh, it's actually four, it's six, it's eight. But anyhow, a few years ago, someone came up with the answer, and I was trying to think of a word that was polite, that could say I was incredibly excited. And then I thought, no, that's rude, I can't say that word. But anyhow, I was incredibly excited, and I had a sort of an academic, um, yes, one of those. And it was amazing, because this was another piece in the puzzle that I needed in working out how the brain really does work. And again, you've got your insular cortex here, if you lift up that bit. Oh, dear. Pork, concentrate. Um, so this is your insula. So this is the posterior insula. This is the middle. And this is the front. This is the anterior. So that's the bit we're talking about. So we've put the information into this bit here. We've blended the stuff from inside your body with the stuff that's coming into your body. And we're now going to pass it forward to the middle area here. What time is tea break, coffee break, whatever? Okay, excellent. You've only got two minutes for your coffee break. But. <laughs> so data from the posterior, the back. Posterior, easy way to remember it is your posterior, your boom. So information from the posterior insula arrives in the middle insula cortex where emotional colour is added to it from the adjacent perigenual area. Peri around genu, the knee. So people, when they genuflex, bend their knee, don't they? You meet the queen and you go, hello. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we add emotional colour. So if I was drinking a glass of Rioja and you said to me, how's your daughter? I'd say, oh, she's doing fantastically well. Just had a second book published. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So pleased. Right? Same question, but I'm outside. I'm soaking wet. It's freezing cold. And you say, how's your daughter? Oh, she's all right. <sighs> right? So how we're feeling emotionally will affect how we respond to things. Okay, so this is where your perigenual area is, this bit just on the bend. This is the subgenual area. This is where you keep your biography. And up here, this is one of the addiction centers. And it's where kids hyperfocus. And all this section here is called the anterior cingulate. So the whole thing from here to here is called the cingulate gyrus. And it's like a, a belt or a bucket handle. Right, so we're going to move on to the second bit of the frontal hub, and this is called the dorsolateral convexity. Lateral just means at the side, and dorso, well, that's a bit difficult because that means at the back. Now, if I was a shark, who's seen Jaws, the movie? Right? And what you see is the dorsal fin, don't you, above the water. Well, because we're upright, my dorsal is here. So in the brain, even though it's where it is, we still, you know, because it's the top, it's not the dorsal, we still call it the dorsal. It's because we're bipeds. So the dorsal lateral convexity is said to have evolved out of need during the early Paleolithic period when a concept of time was essential. So what did we do in the Neolithic period? We became farmers. And what do farmers do? So if you're 
what you have to do as a farmer is plan ahead because you've got to plant seeds that you can't harvest for months and whatever you do harvest has got to provide food until the next harvest. So you need to be able to think in time and to move forwards and backwards because you've got to be able to review how last year's harvest went and think about what you're going to plant this year and when you're going to need that food. I think by the time we have our coffee break after this vodka, I'm going to be under the affluence of alcohol. Okay. So it's the last area of the brain to have evolved during our evolution, and it's the last bit of the brain to actually develop in the human. So many children struggle with time. To them, it can be elastic. If you say, look, do your homework, it's only going to take 10 minutes. Oh, that's forever. Right? But if you say to them, you can only play your computer game for 10 minutes. Oh, that's so short. Right? So time to children is elastic, depending on whether it's something they want to do or not. Um, they cannot tolerate delays. Everything they want is immediate. So if Babe here said, Robin, can I have that new Gucci handbag? And I said, not today, but maybe next week. She'd go, yes, I've got it, right? If she was a six-year-old child and she's after a new Barbie doll or whatever, and I say, no, not today, Daddy hasn't got enough money, she's going to have a meltdown because all she's going to understand is no, not today, no. Not you can have it next week, you can have it at the weekend, no. And so time, things like delayed gratification, that area of the brain needs to grow, develop, mature. How long do you think it takes, Rochelle, how long does it take to grow a human brain? No, 25. Yeah, 25 years to grow a brain, but also to have enough experience for it to have the maturity to function. So we don't, it takes up until 16 years of age to get all the neurons in place and having them all wired up. It takes another three years until you're 19 to prune it back and tidy it up, and then another six years for the whole thing to mature. So thinking that your child is 21, 22, and forget it. You know? Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> OK, one of the important things about the dorsal lateral convexity, I will stop in a second, is that not only does it give us a concept of time, but it's where we think. So have an idea about what you're going to do in the coffee break in two minutes' time, and that's where that is happening, those decisions. And remember, this is one area of the brain, of the three areas, where von Echinoma neurons were found by Fahad Dul in 2008, so that's not long ago. But it's the next component of the frontal hub, the anterior cingulate, that allows us to do something which makes us human. Donkeys can't do it, ponies can't do it, cows can't do it, deer can't do it. That is to pause for thought, to put something before, between stimulus and response. And that's how we've come to be who we are. So we'll pause now for the coffee break and we'll come back and then look at the third part of the frontal hub and then we'll bash on till lunchtime. <laughs> okay, so we're still talking about the frontal hub and I've been told I've got to face this way because I'm upsetting the cameraman. But we're, we're talking about the frontal hub which is three areas of the brain that work together. 
So we talked about the insular cortex, where your reality lives, dorsal lateral convexity, where you think, and it gives you the concept of time. And now we're going to talk about the anterior cingulate. Now, as I've said before, you can't trust the artists. So this is not too bad. The anterior cingulate should finish about here. The bit where I'm on now is one of the uh, pleasure centers of the brain. This bit here should finish at about here. This is the subgenual area. That's where your biography lives. So don't trust the pictures. But we're going to focus on this bit here, the anterior cingulate. So this tiny region of the cingulate gyrus allows us to put a gap between stimulus and response. Now, where I live in the New Forest, we have donkeys, ponies, cattle, deer, and tourists just wandering about. And if you go up to them and poke them, they don't sort of stop and think, oh, he's in a bad mood today. I wonder who upset Robin. They either bite you, kick you, or back off. But if I was abrupt, rude, whatever to you, you have the ability to stop and think, why would he be rude to me today? He's not normally like that. And then you could formulate an answer, you know, something you want to say, and then you could take off the handbrake and say, what's up with you today? That was very rude. So the human thing that we have is this handbrake. And that handbrake that allows us to put a, a stop between stimulus and response lives in that little area of the brain. So this tiny little bit here that I'm touching, just the bit I'm touching, this is where the handbrake lives. Just there. OK? No, it's a secret. <laughs> I'm keeping it from you, Monica. It's this little bit just here. OK? And to the cameraman, it wasn't my fault, sir. <laughs> Could someone bring Monica the gin back down, please? <laughs> OK, so it allows us to have a, a pause between stimulus and response. It allows us to keep still and mentally focus. When of this bit of the brain under functions, you see mental inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. What does that sound like? Yeah? Now, the difference between the DSM and what I think is that I like to know where things are coming from, not which box you're most, most likely to fit into. So the anterior cingulate is a prime target for drugs such as Ritalin. But can you selectively target specific areas of the brain? So if you take a paracetamol, can you say to it, just go to my big toe where it's hurting? No. And so what you're going to get with these drugs is side effects. So the most common side effect with things like Ritalin is going to be loss of appetite, problems getting off to sleep. Or the child just becomes a zombie. Now, is that what we want? So, big question, what is a hub? Well, a hub, or hubs, are the hottest thing in neuroscience just now and will change the way we think about the brain forever. So hubs are areas of the brain, each with a specialized function, that work together to complete a higher function. So this beautiful young lady and the beautiful young lady next to her and myself, we're the frontal hub. You've got your job to do, which is completely different to her job, which is completely different to my job. But we do them at the same time and put them all together, and then we've got a higher function. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
And that is what a hub is. And we've got them all over the brain. But this one at the front, the frontal hub, makes us what we are as human, unless you happen to come from Wales. <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Who said something? It's the off. <laughs> Okay, so when did this all happen? Well, it's a long story, and it goes back to Ardipithecus ramidus. So Ardipithecus ramidus, about five million years ago, was the forest ape. And from Ardi came the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, the bonobo, and then us, who... Uh, <clears throat> I can't say the rude word that's on the board because we're being filmed, who messed it all up. So, basically, Ardipithecus ramidus would have been up here somewhere, and then gradually the gibbons branched off, and then this line developed, and from that line we had Pongo, the orangutan, the gorilla, Pan, from which came the chimpanzee, and the bonobo. And the reason is quite interesting. Originally, there was just the chimpanzee, and this is before the Congo River formed. Now, prior to the Congo River forming, a little group of chimpanzees moved south. Bye, they said, and off they went. The Congo formed, and then you've got the chimps that lived to the north, and these pygmy chimps, as they were called, living to the south. And then gradually these pygmy chimps evolved, and they became the bonobos. And the amazing thing about it is chimpanzees are loud, noisy, aggressive. They murder monkeys. They murder other chimpanzees. The bonobo, as opposed to having a patriarchal society of chimpanzees, matriarchal society, quiet, non-aggressive, totally make love, not war. And if the boys get aggressive in a bonobo group, the girls beat him up. <laughs> so, along came the chimpanzee, and then from that the bonobo, and then us humans who came along and made a mess of it all. And there's a bonobo thinking about us. We're not very happy with what we've done to the planet. Right, so hunter-gatherers. The hunter must live in the moment or the prey will be lost. He must be hypervigilant. The farmer must plan ahead and to do that needs a concept of time. Therefore, as we moved from the Paleolithic period to the Neolithic period, out of necessity, we developed the, the dorsal lateral convexity of the prefrontal cortex, thus producing the frontal hub. So times, quantity, sequences. We, te we tend to think that we've always had time and sequencing, and we haven't. And there's still tribes on the planet that don't have numbers. So this strange thing, which is called autonoesis, means that you, in your mind, can travel through time. You can go back. Someone just said about the conference in Bristol where I bought a doll about so big and put it in my daughter's bed and it frightened her to death. <clears throat> and she said rude words to me. So we can travel back in time. We can be here in the moment or we could plan a holiday. We could say, well, let's go to Egypt. We'll stay near the, the Nile and we'll go to the Valley of the Kings, and we'll go here, and, and we could talk about it, hatchet soup and all the rest of it. And then you could talk to your friends later and say about the Nile and going to the Valley of the Kings, and you'd talk about it as if you'd been. Memories of the future. Now, as far as we know, there's no other creature on the planet that has memories of the future. But our brain, by having time, has got this capability of not just being here and now, but being in the future, being in the past. 
Now, a lot of the pass to other animals is a chemical reaction. There's a smell, there's a sound, and my, the, the amygdala of that creature fires up, and it's a panic reaction because there's a memory of something really, really dangerous happening. But he's not still thinking, oh, yeah, I remember. I was walking along with Harold, and then this lion came out from behind. We don't, you know, animals don't think like that. But we can. We do. It's not, it's not a pretty sight. And I hope your tummy gets better. <clears throat> Okay, the master hub. The frontal hub is fed by various hubs around the brain. So we've got them in the motor area. So if we want to plan a motor activity, we've got supplementary, premotor, all sorts of different areas of the brain that can work together to plan a movement. As you'll see, hopefully in a moment, in our parietal cortex, the bit just here, we have expanded it. We've made it much bigger. Because what do we do? We do talking. Yeah? And then not just talking, we do reading and writing. So we have to have areas of the brain that can do that. So our parietal cortex, is ex parietal cortex has expanded as well. Now this is the really, really exciting bit because my theory started... This vodka is amazing... Um, I started on this idea about 20 years ago, and it's in the last probably four or five years that enough pieces have come together so I can put the jigsaw puzzle together and my thoughts, my hypothesis proves to be true. So following a conference in Japan in 2018, it is the cerebellum, that little brain at the back, that is now considered to be the master hub of the brain. So we were talking about the frontal hub here, which is doing an amazing job making us human. But it's this thing here with 80% of your brain cells which is actually making the whole thing work. So this has been ignored for donkey's years, and I've been calling this the computer that drives the brain. So I talk, and I will be talking hopefully in a minute, about the three-brain theory, which is the one I've held for years. And I've been saying, and I say to kids, this is your computer, because kids know all about iPads and computers. This is the computer. This one drives this side of the brain. This one drives this side of the brain. So this is the important thing, the cerebellum. And it's the first bit of the brain that I work on Somebody just said a moment ago about how the brain works and what's the best way to teach. Start off with the brain stem, cerebellum, and then work the way up because that's how the brain grows and develops normally. So that um, area at the bottom there that's all lit up, that's your cerebellum, the master hub. And this is my three-brain theory. You see it says 59 at the bottom. That's my little guide. That should be the end of the second hour, <laughs> which means there's another hour for me to go through, and I've only got half an hour. Not to worry. So the two cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum each live in a little room on their own. This bit's a bit sad. It's a bit like home alone. Okay, so we've got two brains, right and left uh, cerebral hemispheres, and we've got a cerebellum, and they don't all live happily together as a family unit. They all live in little rooms. So this was someone who kindly lent me their head, and as you can see here, this is where your left brain would live. It's joined to the brain on the other side in this area here, but this is a solid wall, and this, the floor of this cavity, is the roof above the cerebellum. 
So the left brain lives here, the right brain would leave, live there, and the cerebellum lives down in there. So three brains living in three little rooms all on their own. And you can see here, this is a, a skull sawn in half. So what we thought of as being the important bit of the brain, the frontal cortex, lives up in here. And you can see the bone is quite thick here, but this is your sinus. And we developed this sinus because we moved into cold climates. So your breathing has to change depending whether you live in a, a warm climate, hot climate, or a cold climate. And this bit down here, with this really thick bone, is where the cerebellum lives. So where do you put your computer? Do you put it somewhere safe or somewhere vulnerable? <clears throat> and this, this green bit, is the fibres that connect the two sides of the brain. Now, there are relatively few fibres going across. The, the numbers vary, depends who you ask. But it's uh, just a couple of hundred million. And now these fibres can only talk in one direction. So if you're talking of, say, 200 million fibres, there's only 100 million going one way <laughs> and 100 million going the other way. So very limited communication possible. Now this shows you where that actually is. So that's where your corpus callosum is, that bit I just showed you going across so that this side of the brain can talk to the other side. And then there's this one here, which is a tiny, tiny bundle of fibres. And this connects the two amygdalae. So you've got an amygdala there, an amygdala there, and this bit talks from side to side. Did I say the word talk? Did you hear that? Yeah? It, this little bundle here, talk, is where the amygdalae on both sides can talk to each other, and it's considerably bigger in ladies. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm not making any sort of suggestions, but I'm just saying it is much bigger in ladies' talk. Okay. Gender of the brain, I'm going to mention this quickly. Um, there's been a debate for years about is there a male brain, is there a female brain, and people have poo-pooed it for years, saying, nonsense, the female brain is smaller than the male brain, but no different whatsoever. Not true. So, Professor Gallia, University of British Columbia, this is just a couple of years ago, said, all future brain research must state the gender of the brain brains used because there are diseases that affect the brain that affect male and female brains differently. Whether she intended it or not, it's meant that everybody is looking again at is there a female brain, is there a male brain, and the answer is people are looking and saying, actually, there is. There is significant evidence. I'm only going to show you a tiny, tiny little bit. So the cerebral hemispheres are generally much bigger in the male, but you'd expect that because, generally speaking, men are physically bigger than ladies. Right? The cerebellum, the computer, is between 14 to 18% bigger in the male brain than in the female brain. I'm not going to say, you know, well, of course, you know, the cerebellum is the computer and we've got a bigger computer, but because you'd say, oh, he's just being, you know, his usual male chauvinist self. The amygdalae are bigger in males, and that's not a good thing, because, no, because... You can think of the amygdala as being sort of the defense mechanism. If we're going to get aggressive, if we're going to go out hunting and do stuff, it's going to be the amygdala evolved. And a lot of children, when they have meltdowns, it's because that perigenal area we talked about, the emotional center, can't cope. So they, at default mode, is to go to amygdala, and it's not a pretty sight. We've all seen children having a meltdown, sort of, you know, 
Not pretty. So our amygdala are bigger, but yours, even though they're smaller, the neuron density is increased. They're far more compact. The anterior commissure, the gap, the, um, the bridge between the two of them, considerably, considerably bigger in the female brain. Now, how can you say with just these few facts that this lady's brain is the same as my brain when we can physically measure differences in structures? Um, some females, this is really interesting, some females have an extra colour receptor in their eyes. And what I have to do, and I don't like to admit this here, I feel a bit vulnerable, is that whenever I buy clothes, I have to say to my wife, wife is this navy blue? Do these socks work? Because she'll say, are you ridiculous? Why are you wearing that? I said, well... I think it looks okay. Don't be stupid. Go away. <laughs> so, ladies generally are much better at seeing colour, getting fashion things, fashion statements right, like your jacket yesterday that you, you agreed to give me. <laughs> Speech and language centres develop earlier in the female brain and are bigger, which explains why you find it easier to talk. I'm not being rude, but you do. And historically, we were the hunters, you were the gatherers, so the women and the children would be together gathering and doing what you do best. Yeah? Would you agree? You know, if I meet up with someone in the pub, I just go, all right? He goes, all right. <laughs> Pint? Yeah. Send the footy? Yeah. You know? Whereas you ladies can talk forever, can't you? It's true. And this is another interesting thing. It's called petalia. Don't think that the two sides of the brain are symmetrical. They're not. And as you can see here, that the right prefrontal area, considerably bigger than the left, but the visual center, the occipital area, is bigger than on the right. So the brain is asymmetrical because it has dominant functions on each side of the brain. But there are physiological differences. So the people who said, no, 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 you know, the female brain is the same as the male brain, it's just smaller, but there are physiological differences. There are things, areas of the brain, where you use neurotransmitters that we don't use. So we cannot think exactly the same. We can come to some sort of harmony, but my brain will never work like your brain and vice versa. I'm looking at the ladies, right? Other interesting thing is, because of um, Professor Galia's work, there's been research in the past that has just been poo-pooed. And people have suggested there is a homosexual brain that is structurally, functionally different to the male brain. It's not quite a female brain, but it's not, it's not a male brain. And in my last book, I thought, I'm going to stir up a storm. So I said, there is no reason why a female can't have a male brain and vice versa. Now, if you think about it, if you're a bloke and you suddenly decide you want to be a woman because you feel like a woman, you know, it's a big deal, isn't it, to suddenly say, right, I'm going to go through all the thing." Um, you know, so I can grow boobs, I'll have the operation, blah, blah, blah. It's a big deal. Now, what would motivate you to do such a thing? And so I've put forward this idea that a girl could have a boy's brain, a boy could have a girl's brain. And I treat children, boys, who just want to be girls, and girls who want to be tomboys. You know? And so we need to be more open-minded to look at these things and say, yeah, okay, this is a possibility. I'm not saying it's written in stone, but there's enough evidence for us to go back and look again. But all the time, you know, the old school was like, oh, rubbish, rubbish, don't be stupid. Okay, let's look at basic functions of the left and right brains. The right brain deals with everything new. So me coming in here 
first thing, looking around, my right brain's going, oh my God, oh, look, there's hundreds of them, oh, right? And then, once I've looked around for a little while, my left brain takes over, and then my left brain starts looking at the details. Oh, the lanyards are different colours. Why have some got yellow, some got red? I suppose red are the posh people. Ah, oh, maybe purples are better than... Pur so we do this, and that's how our brain works. So right brain deals with everything new, everything emotional, everything defensive. Okay? It adds the gaps between words, the prosody of language. So although the right brain, in the far major vast majority of people, cannot create speech, it is essential, it adds those pregnant pauses where you, when you want to really sort of make a statement, you stop. And then you start to speak again because you know people will listen if you stop. If I spoke like a robot, you would find it very boring and irritating. So the right brain adds that lilt, that prosody. And if you're Italian, it makes your arms move the whole time so you can speak. If you, make, you get an Italian to sit on his hands, that's it. You can't speak. Okay? It does spatial awareness, it does things like geometry. So it can't do pure mathematics, but it can do spatial stuff. It turns off the immune system when in sympathetic mode. Now, the sympathetic nervous system lives in the right brain. The immune system and parasympathetic nervous system live in the left brain. Now, if your right brain is struggling, it doesn't switch on the sympathetic nervous system full stop, but it'll switch it on, switch it off, switch it on, switch it off. And in children, this is a common thing. If the right brain is struggling, they catch everything. Because when you switch on the sympathetic nervous system, you turn off the immune system. Now, you're meant to be in sympathetic mode for a couple of minutes max. So if I'm a zebra living on the plains of Africa and a pride of lions attacked, I'm either going to be lunch or I escape. I'm not going to perseverate for the next three days saying, well, Tilda, you don't know what it was like. I mean, I was just there having my lunch, normal like, and along came, oh, nearly, well, got my bum, we did, you know, see the bruises. Lion, you know, zebras don't perseverate. Two minutes later, they're back out there grazing, everything is fine. Put a zebra in the zoo and they'll get ulcers, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers, because there's low-level stre stress 24-7. You know, I'm a zebra in my enclosure at the zoo and just over there, there are lions roaring. Well, how's that going to make me feel? Right? There's horrible little kids coming through, throwing things at me and making noises and pulling faces and all sorts of stuff. There's noises of tractors and things. And so a zebra in the zoo gets ulcers. A zebra in the wild doesn't, even though it gets chased by packs of lions, prides of lions. So if our right brain gets stressed, it will alter how the immune system works, the child will have a snotty nose, more likely to have asthma, eczema, recurrent infections, glue ear, all that sort of stuff. So again, what I'm pinpointing here is if we know why things are happening, then we can work out where it's happening and then do something to stop it happening. Left brain functions, left brain deals with everything familiar, does speech and language, maths, science, um, all the things associated with speech. So it's not just speech, it's reading, it's spellings, it's numbers. I was saying to someone during the break, lovely word, numerosity. So when they talk about the development of language, they talk about numerosity. And I always think of the, I can't remember the words of the song, but you can imagine a song that finishes, and numerosity. I love the word, sorry. Um, 
Apoptosis, I mentioned earlier, which is programmed cell death. So we produce millions and millions of brain cells, and they're produced in one place. And they have to travel to where they're going to live. And the brain's very accommodating. It puts little signposts saying, right, Rochelle, go right. On a cut, straight on. Right? So the, the, these what are called neurotrophic factors that tell brain cells where to go. But when the brain cells, if they get to where they're meant to go, when they get there, they have to say hello to other brain cells. In other words, make a synaptic connection. So if I'm not formed right in the first place, if I don't get where I'm, to where I'm meant to live, if I don't make friends, I'm going to die. And then during this process of apoptosis, programmed cell death, the brain is pruned back. But, but, you'll discover shortly, after birth, we... We have another 85% of our von Echinomo cells arriving and some other brain cells. And we have to have, that happens four months to four years after birth, but we have to have a second apoptosis. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I came up with this term bpoptosis because I thought A to B makes sense. Um, and there could be problems with apoptosis and bpoptosis that leads to Asperger's. Now, nobody on the planet knows what Asperger's is. There's nobody on the planet that knows what autism is. But if you look at the, uh, the child that goes on to develop Asperger's, they tend to sit very early, often sitting by four months. They tend to skip crawling. They're walking incredibly early and their speech language is described as precocious. They're often said to be little professors. So I think the issues must start before birth, not after birth. And I think it's very much a left brain issue. But you know, we will find out in the fullness of time. If I finish this vodka, am I going to get another jug? Or can you not afford it? So normal brain development, and this is really, really important, under normal circumstances, the left cerebral hemisphere, right, and the right cerebellar hemisphere develop before the right brain and the left cerebellar hemisphere. So that's how it normally happens. So, um, curvature of the spine, scoliosis, prominently happens in girls because girls' brains develop faster than boys' brains, and they end up with a curvature of the spine, and the theory is because the myelination of the left brain and the right cerebellum is advanced of the right brain and the left cerebellum, and that causes an imbalance in the muscles, which causes the spine to grow out of shape. Okay? Now, if there's going to be a developmental delay, which side of the brain is more likely to be affected? The one that's advanced in its development or the one that's normally behind in its development? And the answer is it's right brain, left cerebellar hemisphere that's more likely to suffer. And with the children, most of the children, when you examine them and the people who were foolish enough to sign up for this afternoon. You'd think three hours of me standing here would be enough, so to sign up for another three is foolish. But we'll find out how you can look for signs and symptoms. We'll do a consultation and how you can do the tests. And when you do the tests, you can see the left side of the cerebellum screaming out saying, I can't cope, I can't cope. And so you can pinpoint exactly where the trouble's coming from. And the vast, vast majority of children, it's going to be a right brain, left cerebellar problem. 
Okay, so second generation cells, that's just reinforcing what I said earlier. 85% of those cells, von Ekinoma neurons, that are going to go into your frontal hub uh, come four months to four years after birth. Very few people on the planet know about that. There's also what are called calcium binding calretinal cells, and they are also in the anterior cingulate part of the frontal hub. And what it's thought is that they, their original function was primitive language. Now, when you have a little baby, how many people here have got babies or had a baby? Okay. Now, when they were born, and he went, oh, look at you, you're so sweet. Right, did it say, oh, hello, mum? Right, <laughs> no? Can we, have, can we have steak for tea, please? No? They don't speak, do they? So they make little noises, yeah? I've, um, I've just got, well, I've, I haven't got them. My granddaughter's got them. She's just had twins. And I've got two little great-granddaughter twins. Well, they're not that small, but, okay? <laughs> Well, they're all scrunched up, aren't they? About, about that size. Um, but they haven't talked. They haven't said, hello, great-grandpa. They make funny little noises, yeah? And that's coming from their brainstem mainly. And then later on, they make other little noises. And we humans, I'm going to have to be very careful how I say this, we humans make little noises that don't contain words but we all know what those little noises mean. So if somebody was kind enough during the lunch break to buy me a glass of Rioja, I would stand there, stand there going, hmm, hmm, <laughs> oh, right? You know I was enjoying it. Um, if you were engaged in a, a moment of passion, you might make little noises, and everybody would know you know, if someone was in the next room, they'd think, oh, she's at it again. Right? <laughs> so we make these noises, and this is probably our, our primitive language before we had words. Now, nobody really knows where speech comes from, but we know about the noises. And kids, you know, they go through the babbling phase, don't they? Blah, 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 and, you know, you, and you pretend they're talking. But we certainly have this this part of the brain that does this. So these calcium-binding calretinal cells give us, gives us primitive language, but also gives us non-mimetic facial expressions, which means real facial expressions. So if I said to Rochelle, come on, going to take a picture, smile, right? The smile is artificial, yeah? So if you're making a non-mimetic facial expression, it's real. Children that develop tics, what's the first signs you see of children with tics? Excessive blinking and gr grimacing. Now, if these little brain cells that live in the anterior cingulate area, if they do what we call escape, if they do their thing without being asked to, then what you're going to see? You're going to see abnormal facial expressions. So it gives us a clue as to where tic disorders may originate from. Most of the research out there will tell you it's the basal nuclei that causes tic disorders. It's more likely to come from the cortex. But a lot of the researchers haven't looked in the right place in the cortex to find the stimulus, the, the cells that are escaping. Okay, so this is just a reminder. Paleolithic brain, very much right brain, all to do with focus. And primitive focus comes from this bit here. It's called the frontal pole. We've got it on both sides. It's the right, right one that's going to function at the highest level. It deals with basic quantities, the Paleolithic brain, more or less. So no numbers, just I come to you because I want mangoes, and you give me a mango, and I say, more, 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 right? Thank you, right? So we found this with 
the great apes, primitive tribes in, say, the Amazon, they don't have words for more or less, uh, for, you know, in terms of numbers, three, five. It is just more, more, until I've got enough. They don't have left and right. They have east, west, south, north. And so the, the vocabulary is limited, but it, te- it seems to work at a primitive level. The Neolithic brain required specialization for numbers, time, speech, language. And so even though you think you're suave and sophisticated, most of your brain is still working at a very primitive level. Now, one of the problems we have is that you are generally unaware of what your brain's doing. And as I said earlier, it works like a mobile phone in predictive mode. You put in TH, it's got the... Right? And every now and then my laptop annoys me and it turns on this predictive thing. So when I write something, it goes, the, of. I say, look, I'm a better writer than you are. Okay. Often we only become aware of how we're feeling based on data stored in our data banks, banks from previous experience. Now, we're all, we've all been on the planet a while, haven't we? And we've experienced all sorts of things. And in the back of our brain, in various areas, we have data banks. So you might be feeling sad. You might be feeling excited. But you don't know why. You know, you just wake up and it's obviously going to be a good day. And then your data bank retrieves something. Oh, it's because of this. It's because of that. Right? Now, we've been on the planet a while, so we've got experience. Children do not have the benefit of extensive data backs to fall back on. They lack experience and therefore can become fearful and have no idea why. So children can become sad, agitated, whatever. And you say, what's the matter? I don't know. Their brains are designed to be defensive, right brain, But unfortunately, their rich imagination, right brain, can create monsters out of shadows. They look like us, but they don't think like us. They can't behave like us. Now, there are two minutes left, and then we're going to... I'm going to stop talking, finish the vodka, and then you can ask me questions. Yeah? Now, I think... Emma has run off somewhere to get a wandering mic, so she will be going around the room. It's all organised, yeah. So I'm going to stop, and you can ask me questions for the next half hour. Um, Please, nothing on football, because I'm useless at that. Is it a football question? Okay. What I would like to know, and I don't know what the answer would be, are all our brains, female or male, in the world, whatever nation we live in, if we're African or Indian or from ever, are they the same? Well, the theories are that we all came out of Africa. Yeah. Um, and the theory is that we moved up from the sort of plains further down. And then we got and went across to where Saudi Arabia is, and then we moved off in different directions. And Neanderthal man moved off in the same way, probably before us. So originally, we all came from the same stock. If you go back five million years, we came from Ardipithecus, Ramidus. Um, This is why a, a lot of the sort of comments and the sort of things people say today make me laugh because if you said to me, what, have you got a car? And I said, yep. And you said, what, car, you know, what sort of car you got? I said, black one. But it's not really telling you anything, is it? But we look at people and we judge them on such simple criteria. And I was teasing about the foreign woman back there from Wales. But only because she's my friend. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, but we, we often make very sort of simplistic things we have adapted so 
within our bodies, our, our structure and our function has changed so that even something as simple as the hip, where the, the femur goes into the pelvis, the acetabulum, the actual blood supply is different in the negroid hip to my hip. Mm -hmm. um, our response to temperature, our response to disease is different. But according to the research, we all came, we, we all started with Ardi Pithecus. So we have modified with where we live, our environment, but we are all basically the same. Yeah, because... Only I'm prettier. Um, I'm only asking because we do our play therapy all over the world yeah. and we have not adapted our kids um, to different um, nations. Mm. And because our outcomes are the same in all the countries yeah. and therefore I'm questioning yeah. if the brain... Well, I've done the same thing. I've worked in North Africa... Middle East, America, Scandinavia, Europe, all over. And there's one thing that's universal, and that's the smile. And, you know, kids respond by you, you know, responding appropriately. So the first thing I do is I get on the floor, and kids think, oh, he's not too much of a threat. I'll, I'll jump on him and see what happens. <laughs> Gosh, that was an easy question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Sue Overton, uh, Sue Hardy. I wondered if um, we've seen a lot of more referrals from children with anxiety um, that's perhaps born of the COVID pandemic. And so I wondered, is there any research into the impact of lockdown and COVID on the developing brain for young children? There is, but not... I mean, it's going on, but I'm not aware of what the outcome is. But I, I, know, in, um, I know in Australia there's some research being done. I'm not sure what the outcome is, because a lot of these things are long-term studies, so it's too soon. We think, well, you know... But the COVID is still breaking out. I mean, at the moment in China, the news has been sort of censored. They're not letting too much stuff out, so I don't know what the answer is. But... It's quite interesting. There's a long-term study that was done on 9-11. Everybody remember 9-11? Well, what they did was they went to ladies who were actually in 9-11 by the Twin Towers when it went off, and they were pregnant. So they, they found women who were at 9-11 when it all kicked off and were pregnant, and said, when you give birth, can we take a sample of saliva from you and from your baby? And they said, yes, yeah, fine. And what they found was that the mother and the baby, who were in the womb at the time when it all happened, both had raised cortisol levels. So what they're doing now is waiting for the babies to grow up, get married, have babies, and see if they have raised cortisol levels. Well, that is what I call a long-term study, isn't it? <laughs> How long we got to wait? <laughs> How old are you? Six? Why aren't you married? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I mean, there, there is research going on, but I don't know what the answer is. Oh, oh, oh. Trouble. I appreciated um, your comment about how nobody knows um, about autism and how autism starts and things like that. Do you have a theory about autism? Um, yes and no. One, it would have happened later on. Uh, sometimes, because of this pigeonholing business, the system works, well, it, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. But I've seen endless children, endless. I always remember when I first started, there was this chap from Yorkshire who rang up and he said, I'm the granddad and I want to bring my grandson to see you. So I said, um, right, tell me what the problem is. And he described a kid that had autism. And I said, look, I, 
I don't see kids with full-blown autism. That's not my thing. He said, you're seeing him. So I said, well, you know, you're five hours away and you've got to come all the way. He said, I'm coming. So anyhow, he brought his grandson down and I did the consultation with the child's mother, examined the child, and I said, I am so glad you brought your kid. I mean, I was almost crying. The child had autistic traits, looked like a duck, walked like a duck, but wasn't a duck. And this system we have of going to put you in the dyspraxia box, you're going in the dyslexia, you're ADHD, I can tell, you're going in that box, it is stupid, totally stupid. And fortunately, there's lots of academics who can, you know, not just with the issues of childhood, but right across all the psychiatry, people are saying, we're doing this wrong, this system doesn't work, and we've got to stop it. it is, it's cruelty to children because, you know, you're just saying... You're this, you're this, you're this. And once you've got that label, it's really difficult. To, you know, it's a, and it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because Rochelle turns up in my class and I've read what the previous teacher says and I'm thinking, gosh, she's going to be trouble. And everything she does, I'm going to misread because she is whatever it says on this bit of paper. And that's not how we should treat people. You know, it's the same as I was saying about whether you're Indian, African, Afro-Caribbean or whatever, you're a human being. And you may be a horrible human being or you may be a gorgeous, adorable human being. You know, because your tribe you belong to may not be perfect, but theirs may be. You know? So we can't, we can't just say, oh, I don't like her because she's blonde. Oh, I don't like brunettes. Oh, you know, it's stupid. You know, she may be a very nice blonde or a horrible blonde. I don't know. Is she? <laughs> Said another blonde. Yeah. <laughs> so the answer is I haven't got a clue. Nobody on the planet knows what autism is. But what you mustn't do is just label a child and think this child is going to fail. Because that's not fair. Hi, I don't know if my question is actually relevant. Um, I just noticed I work in um, an in-hospital youth project um, with young people that have suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, and so I've noticed, I mean, I've only worked with it for a very short period of time since March, but I've noticed quite a lot of the referrals that come through. So a lot of the young people that we work with that have got the suicidal ideation and are self-harming um, are actually, there's a, a predominantly higher... Um, with being neurodiverse, so on the autistic spectrum, mm. which I think ADHD and ADD are all part of that spectrum, aren't they? It's, they're on the, that is the, part of the autistic spectrum, so part of being neurodiverse. And I just wondered why maybe there's a possibility of a higher prevalence of having overwhelm, um, which leads to self-harm, suicidal ideation for people yeah. of that. Yeah. Aspect of, um, I have lots of parents, so a different scenario, but I have lots of parents who um, tell me about their children saying things like, I hate myself, I hate you, um, I'm going to kill myself and all the rest of it. And this, this sort of... If I was getting really, really angry with this lady here, I might say to her, I'm going to knock your head off. Right? Am I literally going to knock her head off? No, it's a huge exaggeration, isn't it? I'm going to kill you, right? So the amygdala in here has very aggressive, over-the-top language. And what tends to happen is, if the emotional centre, which is the perigenal area, if that can't cope... So we're talking this bit here. This is where I would deal with my emotions. If that can't cope because that frontal hub is struggling, I'm going to use the amygdala here, which uses over-the-top language. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to knock your head off and all the rest of it. And so a lot of the kids, um, when, they, you know, when they're younger, six or seven, um, they'll... You know, come out with things like, I'm going to kill myself, I don't know why I'm here, I hate you, 
right? And this is, this bit can't cope, amygdala's working. And then as kids get older, particularly if this prefrontal cortex is struggling, they have the same thing. And that leads to wanting to kill themselves. But we, you know, I wouldn't do it, but I often sort of think in here that if a child says, I want to die, I want to kill myself, I said, all right, I'll help you. You know, they go, no, no, right? Because it's just this thing, I wouldn't do it. It's just this thing, well, I might, no, I wouldn't. It's this bit here just being over the top, over dramatic. You know, sometimes you see um, women in films, actresses in films, and oh, everything is so big and dramatic. You know, it's obvious it's over the top, isn't it? But with these kids, it's an act that the amygdala's putting on, but the, it's, it's real. But it's because this bit of the brain can't cope. This bit has to deal with it. So it's like, you know, you go to a funeral and maybe it's a child that's died. You'll see people laughing. You think, well, how can this be funny? But if this bit can't cope, the wrong emotion comes out. Or, you know, a child gets sent to the headmaster and the headmaster's there ready to tell them off. And they go... (laughs) Giggling and... It's not that they think it's funny. This bit can't cope. Wrong emotion comes out. So that's why it happens. Um, We need a better understanding. Society needs a better understanding of how the brain works and then more effective treatment and a greater understanding of these difficulties will be there. But at the moment, the system we have has nothing to offer these people. Does that answer it, sort of? Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just going to ask... Hang on, hang on. Hello. Are you a man? (laughs) I believe so. Um, Hang on, hang on. (laughs) That's all right, he's wearing a skirt. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Um, I was just going to ask about just relating some of your theory to play. So there is a theory called recapitulative play theory, where um, children, as they develop, play up to their evolutionary level. So they they might play through the Neolithic, and um, they might be more kind of like into hunting and um, searching the environment. And then um, maybe when they're get up to near, um, sort of more into farming and things. It's more that it comes out through their play. And maybe, I just wondered if you can, re- if that relates but in It's absolutely way true. What that's what about. happens. The brain, when it starts off, it's the brain stem alone that's working with the hypothalamus. And then gradually the amygdala cut in, the septal nuclei cut in, the anterior singlet cuts in. And we have to go through, you know, Because historically, boys used to play with swords, didn't they? Sword fencing and stuff and running around and whatever. And there was lots of physical games of chasing around in gangs and whatever. And then kids settled down. The problem we've got at the moment, of course, is we're moving into this technological age and children from, you know, just a few months old have got their own smartphones. I've just got a little Nokia. I feel I didn't even bring it in here. I'm too embarrassed, but... Um, kids are being pushed into the age of technology and they now got to adapt to that. But if you look at the sort of, you know, as you obviously, all the experts, look at the history of play, you know, it was politically correct at one time to go sword fencing and running around with guns and whatever. You know, now if you're running around with a gun, somebody will shoot you. So, but uh, yeah, you're right. You've got to go through, as the brain goes through its primitive phases, Paleolithic, Neolithic, technological age, yes, the play will need to change accordingly. And the gender of the brain will dictate play as well. I'm just wondering, sometimes when a child is playing perhaps in the sand, it feels like they're doing something which is much deeper or older, older really, more ancient than the child is. Mm. What, 
I'm, and I'm trying to relate that to what you've been telling us about the brain yeah. and where and how, how that works. Mm. You know, if you sort of think about it, you're getting back, aren't you, to your roots, the soil. And it's quite interesting. I was going to mention this to someone yesterday. We've got um, a, a porch that comes out the front of the house and there were these pillars that came down, wooden pillars, and we needed to replace them. And these have been made on a lathe, so they were quite ornate. And I'm mean, and I thought, I can't afford to have that done. It's going to cost a fortune. So I had this African wood, which is about that square and about by that high. And it's got a posh African name. But anyhow, before they cut the tree down, they say a prayer, because the spirits that live in the tree have to be appeased before, you know, say, you know, thank you for giving me this wood. And they do that. And I think if you go back, you know, because historically, if you look at worship, worship was of the things around you that you didn't understand too well. But, you know, lightning, thunder is very powerful. Huge waves crashing across the sea, very powerful. And we need to sometimes stop being too clever and go back to something as basic as playing with sand. So which bit of the brain? What's, what's happening? Well, it's, it's all of the brain, because the brain is being pushed... For, no part of the brain can work in isolation, but we're pushing it forward and forward and forward with technology, and sometimes we just need to stop. I work fairly long hours, and one of the things that I have to do is I go into the garden, or I've got a garden room I can go into, with my little dog, not the cat, I haven't got a cat, a little dog, a glass of Rioja, and I just take up nature. You know, breathe, smell the air. Um, who knows the word petrichor? Petrichor? You know, it's been really, really hot, the ground's really, really dry, and it rains, and then there's an amazing smell, yeah? That's the volatile chemicals that the rain is releasing from the soil and from the grass. And it makes you feel amazing, doesn't it? Because we all need to get back to nature. So I will sit in the garden and just do nothing. My brain's done enough work already for the day, and so I will just smell things, watch the birds, watch the buzzards hovering you know, on a thermal, watch the bats coming out. We need to get back to those roots. Because, you know, we're giving children technology too early. You know, a little child, a toddler, in a pushchair on their smartphone isn't, isn't good to me. Somebody? I'm here. I'm shy of the microphone. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I, like, Shall I come is, and sit on your lap? <laughs> that would make this way more comfortable. You're right. Um, so this is like evidence gathering, right? We're looking at a brain and being like, this is what the brain is telling us about. Can you talk a little, about, little bit about neuroplasticity and the capacity to change if people are kind of taught coping strategies or if there's been intervention and support? Because that's... Yeah. I don't want to feel defeatist. Yeah. Um, like, this is how the brain is. There are windows of development... And there's probably people here who are much more of an expert than I am. But if you take, say, children from Chinese or Romanian orphanages, if they haven't had the love and the care in a certain window of their life, there's very little you can do to change. Now, going back to where I am, where I live in the New Forest, We've just had endless foals born. So we've got baby donkeys, about, you know, small enough that you could pick up, foals, calves, whatever, right? Loads and loads of them. And you see them, and, you know, I take my dog out first thing in the morning, and there's a little foal stood there like this, saying, oh, now what do I do? I've stood up. And they've just, you know, but they've only been on the planet a few minutes, and they're standing up. How long does it take us to stand? A year. And yet a horse has to be on its feet in no time, otherwise it's dead. Dolphins can swim as soon as they're born. And it's because they're hardwired to do that. Now, there's very little of our brain that gets hardwired, so we can 
have this neuroplasticity, which is amazing. So you can teach old dogs new tricks. So the answer is yes, the brain remains highly neuroplastic. And the thing is, the more you use it, the better it will be. And the example is, if you have someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger and he lost three stone, most people wouldn't notice anything. But if there was a little old lady who was eight stone and at least she lost three stone, everyone would be saying, oh my God, have you seen Audrey? You know, she's, she's awful, terrible. Right? So if you use your brain and it's really fit, you can lose neurons and nobody will notice. So we need to use the brain, get new knowledge in there, and it carries on working longer. But as a side to what you're saying is the other thing we need to do, we all need to do, have adequate sleep and exercise because just recently they've worked out how we get waste products out of our brain. And part of what we need is a burst of exercise. So my little dog gets a walk for at least an hour, two hours, four hours a day at pace so that I'm out of puff and she's out of puff. Now that guarantees that I clear the waste products from my brain because they think an accumulation of those waste products leads to certain types of dementia. So does that answer some of the question? Don't pick on me. You described very beautifully how being in nature... Hang on, I've got to come round there and lip read. (laughs) You described being in nature and how that made you feel more connected with yourself. Uh, What are your thoughts on play therapy only being outdoors or having outdoor therapeutic spaces? Uh, I think we need to be outside, connected with nature... But, of course, we've got our climate to think about. (laughs) So, weather permitting. (laughs) So it depends on where you are in the world, but yes. Um, Ages ago, they they did an experiment where they went into schools and said to children, where does milk come from, where does cheese come from, and all that sort of thing. And this child said, oh, you're so silly, the supermarket. (laughs) And we need a better connection with nature. We need to, you know, be out there. We need to breathe fresh air and all the rest of it. So, yeah, if you could, it would be brilliant to... And a lot of schools have little garden areas and kids plant stuff and, you know, whatever. But I'm all for it. Because we, you know, we spend too much time saying, you will sit there, you pay attention, you do this. And we're not designed to do that. So we need to... Get out and about. Yeah? Where's my girl gone? Oh, there she is. My young lady. Okay. I, I'm not blowing the elephant now. I'm just talking. <laughs> well, no. I just want to thank you really, really a lot for this lovely morning. And hopefully... Everything will go well this afternoon in the workshop. I hope and so. I'm very grateful to Al to have sourced you so that we have. Uh, you, you sourced me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, from which part Jesus. of the brain this happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm really, really grateful and thank you. It's and been a pleasure to be with you all again.